How's your timing this morning? <laughs> you know, we uh, every week we it gets worked through. Our worship planners think how should things be timed, and we knew that Gretchen was going to be baptized this morning, and so we talked about you know what should be the time to do that. Well, what's the best way to start off a worship time? Uh, and with somebody accepting Christ, what a great opportunity to to get to see that this morning. How is your timing when it comes to that? I have become convinced that timing really is important, especially Christmas season. There's a lot of timing going on right now. You have got to order things by a certain date, right? And you've got to mail things by a certain date or else that won't happen by Christmas time. Turkey's got to be in the fridge how long? A few days. If you're trying to thaw a turkey, you've got to get that all figured out based on the weight and then it's got to hit the oven sometime so that it gets done at the right time to hit the table when everybody's ready, right? Timing. If some assembly is required, <laughs> you've got to start that late enough that it doesn't give it away, but early enough that you've got it done by Christmas morning or there's going to be somebody disappointed and you're going to be grumpy. Kids have Christmas morning timing down. They know how to do it. Get up at 5, go jump on mom and dad till they get up. That's Christmas morning timing for kids. And then comes the frenzy of stuff under the tree. You know how it works, right? Take turns. Best gift last. It's all timing. And then after that, who cares? <laughs> well, you do because, again, timing, you're hoping that it breaks before the warranty expires. That's a matter of timing. Christmas is all about timing. Yeah. How's your timing? I'm sitting in a courtroom. True story. It is a serious atmosphere. The sign on the way into the courtroom says, be sure to silence your cell phones. And it says something about if you have inappropriate behavior, the very large bailiff with the gun will be escorting you out of the courtroom. It's really obvious that the courtroom belongs to the judge. So I'm sitting there, an audience in the courtroom, while there is some hushed talking going on up front. And my daughter calls, and it reminds me that I forgot to do what the sign said. Here's the ringtone that played. That went on for about four or five seconds while I quickly got into my pocket to get it quiet. It was long enough for every head in the courtroom to turn and look at me. And the judge looks up. He said, whose phone was that? I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, it was me. He said, really? Who was that? <laughs> well, it was Wynton Marsalis. He said, oh, jazz. That's better than that rap junk most people have on their phones. <laughs> Not good timing, though. Not good timing to have your phone go off in the middle of a courtroom. You ever have a timing problem? There's a word used in the scriptures that talks about timing. Uh, it's used in a command several times, and it's one that we find hard. It's the word wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. How many times have you read that in Scripture? Be patient. More than one person of this church family in recent months has said something to me like, that's really hard to do. Made me think of James, chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, till it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Right before that, James had just written that rich people were condemning and murdering godly people just right before that. And in the next words, he says, therefore, be patient. Really? 
It's hard, isn't it? It's one thing to trust God's timing when it seems like he's doing things according to our timing. That's easy. Just when you needed the money to pay the bill, just when you needed a friend to come to your side, just when you needed to hear the right things said, just when you needed the new job, just when you're about to give up, suddenly God shows up at just the right time. And we like that, amen? amen. That's when God's timing is good. But what about the other times? What about when it seems like God's timing is off? I have a friend in Joplin, Missouri, Steve Bycroft. Steve and his wife, Shanti, served as missionaries in Sri Lanka for many years. It was a country that had been messed up by civil war and terrorism for over 20 years, and there they were ministering in a faraway place. They dealt with all kinds of challenges there. They learned a lot about waiting on God's timing there. And it was Steve, I remember, who shared an insight with me I have not forgotten to this day. God is never late and seldom early. And it was a way of saying that we can trust God's timing always to be right. But we can't expect that he is always going to make it comfortable or easy as possible. And that's the struggle for us sometimes, isn't it? God, never late, seldom early. And then here comes Jesus. That's the series we're going through. Here comes Jesus. One of the features of the Christmas story that can help us, I think, with this whole timing issue in life is to take another look at how Jesus came into the world at just the right time. We've already talked about how God's plan through the birth of Jesus wasn't much like we would have planned it. It was far messier, far grittier than we would have done it. But when you look back on the timing of it, when we look back on the timing of how that happened, when it happened, it can impress upon us and ensure us that God's timing is perfect. He is never late, <laughs> seldom early. And always perfect. So let's look at that together. God's timing in the Christmas story is perfect. And just to point out, by the way, how we can contrast that to imperfection, man's timing of things is out of whack compared to God's. So here's something to remember this morning. You're going to hear this and you're going to go, I can't remember that. That's fine. Forget it, but get the point, okay? 1582. When the Catholic Church made the shift away from the imperfect Julian calendar to the imperfect Gregorian calendar, they had to make an adjustment. So that year, 1582, October, 10 days were erased from the calendar. The day after October 4th was October 15th that year. This is not a joke. But the Gregorian calendar still has problems. Every hundred years, it's off by about 43 minutes. <laughs> add, you know, that up after a while, that's significant. And get this, Jesus was not born on 0 A.D. The whole B.C. A.D. counting system didn't begin until the 6th century. There was a monk named Dionysius. He did his best to calculate the year that Jesus had been born. He dubbed that year... Anno Domini 1, the year of our Lord, 1. And we kept adding from there 2,022 years ago to now. He did the best with what he had, but then new information was found. Scholars have pretty well concluded that's not exactly right based on what's been discovered. It's still not certain, but Jesus was born somewhere from 6 to 4 B.C., Remember that part. Here's the point. We've got this all out of whack. No human alive is certain about the year that Jesus was born. But you know, I am certain of this, that Jesus was born at exactly the right time. That God's timing was perfect. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That's good news. You know, the sense of the word at the beginning of those verses, the fullness of time, it's, it's when time was completed, when everything that needed to happen had happened, when that was all fulfilled, then God sent forth his son. God, who is never late and seldom early and always perfect in his timing. Why not send Jesus to the earth scene 400 years earlier when Israel back from exile, was struggling. They could have used some help 400 years sooner. They were longing to hear from God. What made the year that Jesus came, that day that Jesus came, just the right time for Jesus to be born? Well, looking on it from this side of history, it's a lot easier for us to say, sure enough, it was just right. The time had fully come. The world was ready for Messiah to appear. Go back over history and look what's going on leading up to that time. Alexander the Great had conquered the known world by 323 B.C. And as Alexander the Great conquered everyone, he spread Greek culture. He thought everyone should learn Greek. (laughs) Aren't you glad he's not in charge? He thought everyone should learn Greek. Greek art should be what people do. Greek God should be who people worship. And so he spread that culture. Greek became the second language over the Mediterranean world for some 600 years. Faithful people at that time translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek. So for the first time in history, the largest number of people could read God's word. The same was true of the New Testament while it was being written in Greek. So those things came together. It was a good time for Messiah to come. The Greek Empire fell to Rome, and Rome made its contributions, one of them an extensive system of roads, military roads. They used them so that they could also conquer everybody, but then they were used to get around some quarter of a million miles of roads, many of which still exist today across Britannia and Spain and Germania, to name a few. Now, the Romans didn't plan it this way, but those roads then became a way that the gospel could be taken from its beginning place in Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world. Unlike any other time in history before, the world was ready for Messiah. History records what is also called the Pax Romana, Roman peace. Kind of a joke, that's the name of it. One writer said this, Rome had brought world peace, but with peace came heavy taxes, armies of mercenaries stationed in every land, Roman culture and values, the gladiatorial games, slavery and misery. (laughs) And the Jews, though they were oppressed during that time, were also building these buildings called synagogues. They couldn't make it back to Jerusalem to worship. And so the center of worship became scattered all over in places called synagogues. Jews were already gathering weekly to be at the synagogue. Does it sound like something you're familiar with? Yeah, here we are. Look at us. So that when the gospel started and Paul, for instance, went someplace to a city to teach people about Jesus, the first place he would typically go was where people who believed in God were already gathered. Synagogues. The world was ready for Messiah to come. The Jews were under Roman rule. If Caesar Augustus wanted to take a census and require everyone to return to their birth city, well, he'd do it. He did. A Roman soldier could come across a Jew and say, hey, you, carry my pack, plebeian, and they'd have to do it. If a Roman citizen and a Jew both committed the same crime, the way the Jew was treated was a lot different. You can bet that Jews of the first century when Jesus came, you can bet they were wondering about God's timing. One song that we sing this time of year, it's hundreds of years old. It's one of the oldest of Christmas songs, and it really doesn't speak about shepherds or angels or Bethlehem or wise men. It just reminds us of how the Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come. 
O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny, from depths of hell thy people save and give them victory over the grave. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home, make safe the way that leads on high, and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. God's people, the Jews, were anxiously waiting, and I just wonder what they thought about God's timing. So all these things came together, all right? Greek language, Greek translation of the Old Testament, Roman roads, relative peace, synagogues, where people were already gathering. And add to that the way that by the first century, this idea of all of these gods that really weren't very powerful and terrific anyway was starting to lose steam. People were tired and ready to hear the truth about one true God. It was the perfect time in human history. Now, we wouldn't have picked that. We couldn't have picked that. But God knew that it was perfect. And at just the right time, here comes Jesus. Because God's timing is perfect. Let me tell you that God's timing, not of just human history, but of your story and my story, is also perfect. Racine Christian Church, Racine, Missouri, Every year while we were living in Missouri, they did what was called a walk through Bethlehem event for their community. It was a small community, but a lot of people went to Racine to see the walk through Bethlehem. It was set up with live scenes of people like a, like a village, like Bethlehem would have been, and you could interact with the people. And it was there to tell the story of Jesus' birth every year at Christmas time. One year at the end of it, a lady approached John St. Clair, a friend of mine there, who was the preacher in Racine, she told him, I really appreciate you putting this on. It's always so good. But next year, could you maybe change the story a bit? It's the same every year. <laughs> what British theologian Don Cupped has written is true. Christmas is the Disneyfication of Christianity. And I suggest to I suggested to John that next year, maybe to help out and help that lady, they could do like a walk through Whoville or something like that. <laughs> they never took me up on that suggestion. Now we laugh because we understand that the story of Jesus' birth is history. History is things, by definition, something that's already happened. That's history. You can't change what has happened. And that's just not what this time of year is about. But that's la that lady's request does remind me of the fact that there are a lot of people this time of year who are pretty dissatisfied with their lives and they would love to see something changed. They would love to see some kind of a change in their world. For them, Christmas is just like another mile marker, right? They don't want this Christmas to be just like last year, lonely, shallow, tiring, empty. And it always comes at the same time. It's always at the end of a year. And maybe this has just been a rough year for some people. I could point to several people sitting here this morning and say, I'm sure it has been. And they're hoping that next year will be different than this past year. And so to help those people, we unpack and, and we dust off some decorations that we have been dragging out for years. We repair the electric bells that get hung on the Christmas tree and have been ever since 1990. We play and we sing along with the songs that we've heard most of our lives. We go through the motions of celebration that have remained largely the same. And beneath it all, we unwrap this same old story, the short and simple accounts of an eternal and complex plan, the entrance of God into human flesh at just the right time. But God's plan is more than just something to marvel at. It's something that is also aimed at you and at me. One phrase I hear tossed around a lot this time of year as John was going through the list of things he hates. Here's mine. It's, it's in the, all the corny Christmas movies, by the way. And that is the spirit of Christmas. 
the spirit of Christmas. What does that mean? Kind of like what gets called the true meaning of Christmas. You know, there is one person that I have heard on the screen at Christmas time who gets it right every year. It's Linus who talks about the meaning of Christmas and then reads from Luke 2. Stuart Briscoe in his book, Meet Him at the Manger, said the spirit of Christmas needs to be superseded by the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christmas is annual. The spirit of Christ is eternal. The spirit of Christmas is sentimental. The spirit of Christ is supernatural. The spirit of Christmas is a human product. The spirit of Christ is a divine person. This whole arrival of Jesus on earth at just the right time in human history is also just the right time in your story and in my story. Every one of us has a story. It looks, it looks basically a lot like the guy who was praying one day, Lord, I've done really well so far today. Haven't become angry, haven't lusted, haven't shot my mouth off, I haven't lied or coveted. Pretty soon here, though, I'm going to be getting out of bed, and I'm going to need your help. <laughs> That's kind of our life story, if you think about it, isn't it? We all start out without sin. Like my dad used to say about himself, I had two distinct disadvantages when I was born. I was very young and very inexperienced. That's true. When we're first born, we can't even choose to do right or wrong because we don't realize what a choice is. But at some point in our personal history, each one of us takes up that choice and we begin to mess it up. Paul says it really simply. For all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. That's your story and my story. John in 1 John puts it this way. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So everyone go ahead. Admit it this morning. Just like a, an anonymous meeting. Hi, my name is Sherm and I'm a sinner. That's my story and that's your story. And that's everyone's story. Our sin separates us from God, makes us his enemy, earns us eternal punishment. Go back in your personal life history and think about that. God's timing has been perfect all along, no matter how many mess-ups you have pulled off. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 5. I want to encourage you to get your Bibles open to Romans chapter 5. And just get that open in front of you this morning, if you would, please. I want you to see there how Paul speaks about God's timing in our story. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Take a look at that. Just keep it in front of you and, and just kind of scan through with me. And first of all, look at where we were. We were still weak, ungodly, sinners, enemies. God didn't wait around until humankind deserved it. Neither did he wait until you got your act together to set it all into motion. He knew way beforehand you needed to be brought back. He didn't do it because you were finally nice enough that he would do that for you. He did it while we were his what? Enemies. But at just the right time, here comes Jesus. 
Look what God does. God shows his love. Christ died for us. Some of you here this morning have got that all wrong. You think that the way you follow Jesus is you get yourself all in order and then you can start. You get everything right and then you begin. That's not how it works. He already did the work that you needed to have done so that you could begin. And if you think you're going to somehow get good enough to deserve God's forgiveness and then you can begin a relationship with him, you've got this all wrong. Jesus didn't die for perfect people. He died because we were weak, we were sinners, we were enemies. That's what it says here. And if that's where you're at, then you're in serious shape this morning because he died to undo all of that about us. If we could do it on our own, he wouldn't have needed to die. So now, where are we? Look again. We have been justified. We are reconciled. When you're a person who has rebelled against God, which is, by the way, every one of us, there's only one way that you can be sure that you will live forever. It's called justification. That's where God looks down on you and me, and because of our faith in Jesus Christ, he declares weak, ungodly, sinful people innocent of guilt. Our debt's paid by the blood of Jesus, and we people who made ourselves his enemies have been made his friends again. We've been reconciled to God because Jesus died for us. That's what he has done. So what's going to happen? Look at it again. Look there in Romans 5. What does it say? It says we shall be saved. It says it again. We shall be saved. And that's the big point of Romans 5, 6 to 11. If God treats weak, ungodly, sinful enemies this way, if Jesus dies for the most undeserving, ungrateful, ungodly people, then how much more likely is it that that same God will now save us if we have come to him? If God extends this grace to the people who've messed up, how much more will he save the people who have come back to him? Isn't that good news? God's timing in your life story is perfect. Just like it has been in human history. You see, you needed to hear that this morning. You think you're here by accident? Or did you need to hear that this morning? Is God doing something right now, right here today? You like his timing? So here's the you and me part, all right? God's timing in human history is perfect. God's timing in my history and your history is perfect. Your timing is critical. I'm not talking about when you thaw the Christmas turkey. I'm not talking about did you get your Christmas cards in the mail soon enough. I'm talking about the way that you're here today living and breathing and able to determine where you're going to go from here. Your timing is critical. If you ever watch a relay race, relay runners, you can be sure that they are fast. You've got to be fast to be a relay runner. But you know what? No matter how fast they run, that's not all that matters. Maybe it's not what matters near as much. Because when they start running and how they receive the baton and whether or not they hang on to it correctly and whether or not they hand it off because that baton handling has the potential to make or break their time. When you decide to follow Jesus as Lord in your life is critical this morning. And let me tell you, God has already told you when you need to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our, our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I like God's timing. His timing is perfect. Here comes Jesus at just the right time. 
Christmas can help you realize how much your timing matters. Jesus came at just the right time. And God has made it clear that where timing is concerned, the day of salvation, the time of God's favor, when is it? Now. now. Today, you have that opportunity. We got to watch Gretchen baptized into Christ today. My prayer has been that that would be true of someone else, that there's someone who understands, hey, I need to do this too. I need to get right with God. I need to begin life with him. I need to make him Lord in my life. Your timing is critical. You have this opportunity. If that's what you're ready to do today, we're going to invite you to do that. Would you all stand with me? And if some of you know someone who needs to accept Christ, would you please grab that person and drag them down the aisle? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not how it works, is it? It's this, this is your choice, you and God. This is your choice before God to make today. But while we're praying that you'll make that choice because we want you to be right with him. We're going to pray. We're going to sing a song. If you're ready to make that decision, you come forward while we're singing today. Let's pray. Father, these words remind us that you are the one in control. You are the one who set creation into motion and who has been involved in that creation ever since and involved in each of our lives personally. Thank you, Father, for how the story of Jesus coming into the world assures us of that. It reminds us how you have been there all along that you've reached out to us and invited us. And today, this moment, this critical time, we have an opportunity to respond to that. Oh, Lord, look into our hearts, please. Find, standing here today, people who are willing to say yes to you, whatever it is that you would ask of us. God, for those of us who have uh, looked back on our own life history with appreciation for a day that you applied that forgiveness in our lives, Help us to live as if it is just brand new every day. And Father, for those today thinking about that decision, will you please uh, complete that thought process? Help them to see that this is the moment. As you have said, now is the time of salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.